Well, hey, good morning, friends, and welcome back to the teaching and preaching ministry of Mohican Church. My name is Pastor Paul. I am so glad that you could join us for another message in the series that we've entitled Unashamed. It comes, of course, from the book of Romans, and we're going to be in Romans chapter 5 today, but uh, it comes from the book of Romans, and the series, the theme of the series is based right out of Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Those of us who gather here in this room uh, for worship, those of us who gather in person, we have been reciting that verse ev at the start of every, uh, every worship service, well, the start of the sermon time. Been reciting that together, not because uh, it's important to, to chant a verse, nothing like that. In fact, if you're picturing chanting, you're, you're, you're out there somewhere. We've been repeating it, though. For one thing, we want to make sure that we get it embedded in our hearts. Secondly, though, we want to, um, we, are, we are just reminding us of the power of the gospel, the, the power of God for the salvation of all those who believe. And so, uh, so we repeat this verse Sunday after Sunday after Sunday until it becomes not simply an expression of our lips, but the outpouring of our hearts, where we live unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, hey, listen, join me in prayer, and then we're going to get into our message this morning. Well, Father God, we do thank you, Lord, that you have given us the privilege to gather here before you today to open up your word, uh, Lord, and to find therein its truths for for our, uh, for our good, uh, Lord, that we might grow in it, that we might grow through it. Take it and plant it deep in us, we pray. We thank you, God, for the hope that your word uh, gives us. And in this message today, what a life-giving passage we find in Romans chapter 5. So, God, thank you for that. Uh, Lord, as we turn to it, you do know, Father, the distractions that we have in our lives um, Help us, Lord, to commit those things to you so that we can fix fully on the promise of your word. We love you, Father. We love you, Father. We thank you for the work that you have begun in us. We hold fast to the promise that you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. And we pray all this in his mighty name. Amen. So as we get started uh, this morning, again, I want to encourage you to have your Bibles open and ready. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, we read this. <clears throat> so therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. For we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him by the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Well, you've been around the text long enough, perhaps, or if not, you're going to hear it here today, that, that any time you see a therefore, 
we really are pressed to, to pause a moment and look and see, well, what's it there for, right? So therefore, since we have been justified through faith, so therefore, what's Paul reaching back to, if you will? What's that backward glance? Well, he's looking back upon the text that we find in chapter 3, verse 21, through the whole chapter 4. In Romans 3.21 through chapter 4, verse 25, we read all about, um, we read all about that righteousness then is, is credited to us by faith in Jesus Christ. Here he talks about we have been justified through faith. Therefore, since we have been justified as a result of our justification through faith, well, yeah, if you look through 321, clear up through chapter 4, we understand that, that it is our faith that is credited to our account as righteousness. Paul made the argument in chapter 4 after he had, he had made that bold statement in the, in the closing verses of chapter 3, but then he makes uh, the argument in chapter 4, he says, listen, not even Abraham. Now, Abraham was so highly revered by the Jews. And Paul says, listen, not even Abraham was good enough in the things that he did to be declared righteous in the sight of God. Not even him. And so what we're dealing with here, that's what he's looking back upon when he said, so therefore we have been justified through faith. Through faith. Not even Abraham, not you, not your mama, it's uh, we, those who are, have been justified, those who have been fully pardoned, those who have been declared righteous, for that's what it means to be justified. Those who have that legal declaration of righteousness, uh, that not a single person has done that on their own. That's come only by faith. And so, so Paul begins, what we have is this chapter in fact, these chapter breaks were not put in by God. They were put in by man so that we wouldn't lose track, I believe, of such important texts just like this one. So we can just say, oh, no, wait, go to chapter 5, verse 1, and look. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. I, I pray that you never lose the wonder. I pray that I never lose the wonder of what it is to be at peace with God. Now, I do know that if you listen to the culture, um, shoot, if you listen to either, even some misguided church folk, you're going to hear people say, well, God's just love. God's just love and he's grace and he's goodness. He is all of that. But he also is justice. He also is righteousness. He also is truth. He also is wrath. I mean, he's all of those things. And so those who don't understand or have chosen to look with a blind eye upon God as a God of wrath, they may not think anything about so big deal. We have peace with God. Of course we do. Uh, <laughs> we're, well, we're going to talk about that. But I do pray, friends, that you never lose the wondrous. Wait, we have peace with God. Peace with God. Now, listen. So some of you, um, so some of you may be hearing that and saying, I'm not sure what the deal is. Of course, we have peace with God because he's good. And that is true. Uh, and I'm good. That's not true. Uh, but you may be thinking, of course, we have peace with God. I had that, you know, on my own, apart from Jesus. Uh, you most certainly did not. But those who have been justified through faith have peace with God. Those who have been declared righteous by God with the righteousness that he sent from heaven, his son, Jesus Christ, going to death on the cross. Those individuals have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Up until that point, we were enemies of the cross of Christ. And, and I, I often make reference to these, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But it is this reminder 
Romans chapter 5, verse 10, which we're, we're going to see in just a few minutes. For if when we were God's enemies, Paul's just making clear once again, you know what, we used to be enemies of God. Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 3, it says it this way. It says, so, so listen, we used to gratify the cravings of our sinful nature, and following its desires and thoughts, and like the others, we were by nature objects of wrath, okay? And so the scripture speaks about our life apart from Christ, and we were enemies of God. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, 18 reminds us that it uses the phrase, we're enemies of the cross of Christ, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about the need for reconciliation. Why? Because we were enemies. Enemies of God. Now listen, I don't know. Uh, now some of you may know what it is to have a real enemy. And by that, I don't mean uh, the kid that, you know, hit you with spitballs. Uh, boy, I just really aged myself there, didn't I? But hit you with spitballs when you came walking onto the bus or you know, through the cafeteria or whatever. I don't mean that. I mean, some of you know what it is, uh, having spent time in the military, perhaps, to, to know what an enemy is. I mean, to that sense uh, of going out, and it's like, no, listen, there is somebody out there uh, who has put a bullseye on my back, and everywhere I go, I've got to watch myself. And you know, uh, you know then what it is to never really fully be able to rest. Well, imagine, imagine, because those enemies could only be in one place at one time. Imagine the restlessness in, in the heart of the human being who understands that it's like, no, here's where the restlessness comes from. I am an enemy of God. I am an object of his wrath. Now, there is no place in all creation where God is not present at all times, right? And so it isn't a matter of, well, listen, you know what? He's, he's, he's really up to something there in Asbury right now, so he can't do anything with us. Well, of course he can, and I believe he is. But if you're looking at God as an enemy, it's like, oh, you know what? Listen, he's really kicking somebody's tail over there, so I'm safe. Uh, no, think about it. As an enemy of God, an enemy of the cross of Christ, an object of his divine wrath, they know where you can hide. There's nowhere you can hide. So, so some of us, when we read this text, that through faith, or since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us can barely even recall what it was like to be an enemy of God. You know, to wake up every morning as an enemy of God, we, we can barely even recall what it was like to, to realize that everywhere we went, he could see us. Every thought we had, he knew us. Every evasive maneuver we planned. I mean, I'm thinking of Adam and Eve in the garden, right? He was fully aware of it. Those things that we thought we were doing in secret were in broad daylight to God, right? Nothing hidden from his sight. Some of us barely even recall what it was like to wake up every morning as an enemy of God. Some of us only have to think back to when we got out of bed this morning. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Friend, I can't help but wonder, have you found the peace that comes in knowing the one from who you hide as your hiding place? See, he, he desires to be our hiding place, not the one from whom we hide, but as an enemy of God. And by the way, I do believe that, that those who love their darkness, that's why, as an enemy of God, it's like, I don't want his light shining on me, so I don't read the word, I don't uh, show up in worship, I don't go to church, I don't... I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hide. By the way, that's just foolish. Flat out foolish. There's nowhere in all creation where you can hide from God. It's a huge deal to have peace with God. 
It's a huge deal. And so anyway, listen, I pray that you never lose the wonder. You can go this day, if you look to God in faith in Christ Jesus, through faith in Christ Jesus, you this day can, can turn from hiding from him to hiding in him and having peace. What a beautiful opportunity. And so, uh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So, we have peace with God, and not only do we have peace with God, but all of a sudden, look what has opened up to us. We have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Hebrews chapter 4 describes it like this. Give me just a moment. Hebrews chapter 4. In verses 14 through 16, the writer of Hebrews describes it this way. So for the word of God, whoops, excuse me, that's the wrong verse, that's verse 12. <laughs> Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way like we are, yet was without sin. So let us therefore then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so indeed we rejoice. We have this one in Jesus Christ who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because, well, he's been tempted in every way like we are, yet was without sin. And that, so coming to the Father through Christ, we have peace with God and are invited into this throne of grace with confidence. With confidence because of Jesus Christ, where we're going to find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And so what a beautiful thing. And so that's what Paul's writing about when he says, through whom we have gained access through Jesus Christ, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. In which we now stand. So do you have the picture? We were enemies of God. We were on the run constantly. Uh, quite honestly, we didn't find rest to stand even for a little while. We're constantly on the move, constantly trying to outrun the long arm of the Lord. And, and, but here it is now that we have this peace with God and we have the grace in him through Jesus Christ to stand in this grace. And I, I don't think I'm making too much of that. What a beautiful gift that we can stand in his grace. Not, not shrinking back, not hiding away, not ducking and covering, but standing in his grace with confidence, according to the writer of Hebrews. And then we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The hope of the glory of God, it just it reminds us, doesn't it? Does it make you think? The hope of the glory of God. Well, what is the chief end of man? Well, so here we were as enemies of the cross of Christ, unable in every way to, to glorify God in our living, in our being, because of our sin, desperately needing salvation. Uh, so, so before Christ, that was our brand, but we have been, through faith in Jesus, we have been declared righteous in his sight. That gives us peace with him. That allows us to stand in this grace where we can find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. And then we have this hope of the glory of God. The chief end of man is to glorify God, right? And, and to serve him forever. The chief end of man to glorify God. The chief end of man accomplished in Jesus Christ. So 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 really talks about uh, 
both of those references give us some kind of insight in that those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, there is this, there is this, this phrase, and Paul wrote to, to young Titus about this notion of being a trophy of God's grace being a trophy of God's grace, that the work that he has done in you, the work that he has done on, in me, will be, uh, that, that we will be on display for the glory of his great name as trophies of God's grace. And so, listen, what a beautiful, what a beautiful privilege, what a beautiful promise, what a beautiful picture he has given us here. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So, so our lives, when we were stained in sin, our lives, they would bring shame and disgrace to the great name of Jesus our Lord. We have this hope of the glory of God, this reality, not fully yet experienced, as long as we're in this body, but we have this reality, the glory of God. As trophies of grace, our lives, having been redeemed, uh, from the pit, having been rescued, having been made able to stand then in this grace with confidence, a holy boldness, all because of Jesus. Trophies of his grace. So, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 and, uh, and Ephesians 2, 7 through 9, you, you, you have some of the, the wording there that helps us have that imagery of being a trophy of God's grace. I don't know about you, but I, I ain't never been much of a trophy. <laughs> I mean, I have a concept of a trophy in my mind. But, but how beautiful is it to this, this picture of a trophy of God's grace? It's like, no, listen, I, I so, if there is a way, and there is, through faith in Jesus Christ, for a life that once brought shame and disgrace to the name of Jesus Christ to now bring glory and honor to God, I want that. I want that. To be a trophy of his grace for his glory. Not that people would glorify us. That's never been the point. But that people would glorify God. All right? So, Verse 3, then he takes kind of an interesting turn. If you're paying attention to the text, here it is. He says, so not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering. So we were rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. So there is this glory, this joy that, that far outweighs our present sufferings. The Apostle Paul talked about in other letters. So he talks about us rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. But now he says, no, but... Not only that, we also rejoice in our sufferings. Rejoicing in our sufferings. Listen, I do know that there are those who preach, uh, listen, if you just give your life to Christ and send me $1,000, then, then everything's going to come up roses for you. It's going to be all roses and sunshine until the day you die. And that'll be a painless death, of course, because, well, the whole wealth and prosperity nonsense gospel that is not a gospel that is not a gospel not a legitimate gospel the legitimate gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ says no listen this here it is we have gained access through Jesus Christ through the blood that he shed on Calvary we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we have confident assurance of the glory of God with that which once brought shame, through that with which once brought shame and disgrace. But we're not just rejoicing in that. No, 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 we're also rejoicing in our sufferings. Friends, you need to know, if you don't already, I assume you do, that peace with God doesn't mean that it's all sunshine and roses after that. It does not mean that a bit. And I think that's important for us to understand uh, because there are those, uh, there are those, maybe you, who are like, yeah, well, you know what, maybe I could just, you know, I want to give my life to Jesus so I can enjoy some smooth sailing. You know, it is hard to kick against the goads, as Jesus said in the book of Acts. And so maybe now, when I move from being an enemy of God to a friend of God, then, then the sun is always going to shine, the birds will always sing, uh, the waters will always be sweet, and the foods will always be plentiful. 
and taxi drivers will always be nice. Well, you know what? Uh, so there is this uh, there is this reality that Paul just drops into the middle of this and says, "No, you know what? We also rejoice in our sufferings. We also rejoice in our sufferings." And, and so we we see as you look at this. So so suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope that does not disappoint. God's poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. And so, so, so don't overlook, because I might forget to come back to it, don't overlook the promise of the Holy Spirit and, uh, and the strength that we find in him to rejoice in these sufferings and to, uh, so, so the Holy Spirit is, is the one who makes us able to, to rejoice in them, but also to remain under that hupomene that we read about in James chapter 1, 2 through 4, the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you might be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We read in James 1, 2 through 4. We, we can we can rejoice in this. We have this confidence that it's like, no, listen, hope doesn't disappoint. Because again, New Testament hope is, uh, is a reality. It is, a, it is an assurance of a reality that we haven't yet fully experienced. That's what hope is. It's not wishing on a star. The Apostle Paul talks about it here. He says, no, hope will not disappoint. And then points right to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Suffering is going to produce perseverance. Perseverance is going to produce character. Character is going to produce hope. And so there is something in this, and I, and I guess I want to encourage you in this, because we're talking about how, okay, well, in the first couple of verses, okay, now, so by faith, we have been justified. Now we have peace with God. It's like, oh, cool, this is awesome. And it is awesome. But, but listen, when hardships come, you know, Paul is reminding the church in Rome, he says, and, and my goodness, of being a Christian in Rome, <laughs> that's probably a lot like, uh, in some ways, being a Christian in the United States today. Uh, no, there was a whole lot of godlessness going on. It was rampant. And, uh, and as you know, there were those Christians who were in, um, you know, those who were in Christ in Rome who, uh, who became the subject of great scorn. And so, so Paul wanted them to know, as we must know, it's like, no, listen. So you have this grace in which we now stand and you can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then it's as if he says, now listen, but there are going to be difficult times and don't you give up. Don't you give up. Don't you back down. Don't you let the enemy convince you that God has turned his back on you. He has not. He is actually continuing this work in you. You have this grace in which you now stand, this kindness that you did not earn, that, that has nothing to do with what you have afforded on your own. You have this grace in which you now stand, and you have this hope. So a promise that is not fully realized. It will be, but in the meantime, you're going to have hard days. There's going to be hard times. And God is using that for our good and for his glory. And I, and I so love that. It's one more tool that he will rip from the hands of the enemy. Because have you noticed that when hard times come, the enemy loves to press in and say, hey, let me see what kind of chaos I can produce here. You know, what, let, me, let me see what kind of heartache. Let me see if I can uh, cause this individual to turn his back on God. Let me do that. Let me get, uh, see, the enemy often says, let me see if I can get him or her to turn their back on God or uh, to convince them that God has turned his back on them. Satan's a liar and he's the father of lies. And so how beautiful is it when, when difficult times come and we do feel like it's like, no, listen, I just, I, I give up, I surrender. Here is scripture saying, no, wait, listen, listen, we're going to rejoice in our sufferings. By the way, Paul knew suffering. If we had, if we had time to go through it today and we do not, uh, 
But, but I want you to sometime when you get a chance, look up the sufferings of the Apostle Paul. The dude knew what he was talking about. So when he said we rejoice in our sufferings, he knew suffering for the sake of the gospel of Christ. He knew suffering for doing nothing other than proclaiming Jesus, all right? He knew what it was to be falsely accused. Here's your whole crime. You believe in Jesus and you say his name out loud. How dare you? He suffered imprisonment, he suffered beatings, he suffered shipwrecks and snake bites and all sorts of things. He was beaten, he was chased out of town, he was stoned, he was left for dead, all for the sake of the gospel. And he says, ah, but we rejoice in these sufferings. Why? Because we know that God's going to use them. The enemy wants to press in and try to use those things to destroy us. But God rips these things out of the enemy's hands. The, the things that the enemy wanted to use to destroy us, to silence us, to, to, uh, to, to put a stop to our witness, God rips those things from the enemy's hands and says, now, nah, I'm going to use this instead to produce in them Christ-like character. I'm going to use these very things instead to, to bring about the strengthening of their faith, uh, to, to really hone them, uh, to sharpen them into tools fit for the master's use, that we, that we would not be ineffective and unproductive. I'm going to use them there. When you have a chance, uh, in case you're thinking, I really don't like the idea of this, you know, this whole notion of God allowing hardship. Uh, hey, listen, sometimes he flat out brings it, okay? But, but God does allow hardship. You could read Job chapters 1 and 2. You can see all about that. You can look in John chapters 9 verses 1 through 3. A man who was born blind, uh, according to Jesus, so that the work of God could be displayed in his life. The man lived for decades as a blind man so that God's work could be displayed. You read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, about the Apostle Paul and the thorn that was given to him in his flesh, and he pleaded with the Lord three times that, that the Lord would take it away. And, and in essence, God said, Now, nah, my grace is sufficient. My strength is going to be made perfect in your weakness. And so, so here Paul says, listen, you have peace with God. That doesn't mean that life is going to be filled with peace. That does mean, though, that when trials come, when hardships come, they can't wrestle you away from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, 31 to 39 talks about that. If you have opportunity, you can turn over to that. Uh, you can look over into John chapter 10, where we're reminded about verses 29 and 30, that, uh, that we are safe. in this. If we are in the Savior's hands, we are safe in the Savior's hands. No one can snatch us away. No one. So anyway, but so God, uh, Paul reminds the church. It's like, no, listen. Peace with God doesn't mean that life here is, uh, is always going to be smooth and that the winds will always be sweet. In fact, there's going to be hardship. Jesus said to expect it. Just don't think for a moment that God has turned his back on you. Uh, he is using that to refine you. All right? So, verses 6 through 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Did you catch that? Christ died for who? For the ungodly. You did well. If you are in Christ today, you did well not to wait until you got yourself all cleaned up to come, and, uh, to, come to Jesus Christ. You did really well not to do that. Because see, here's the thing. Our enemy... Uh, the one who in the book of Revelation is called the accuser of the brethren, the enemy of our souls, Satan, the liar and the father of lies, he will continuously point out one stain from our past after another. And so if it were your goal, it's like, no, I'm just going to clean myself up. I'm just, I just need to read some things up, and then I'm going to come to Jesus. You see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, 
Christ died for the ungodly. For the ungodly he died. He didn't die. Uh, according to the scriptures, he did not die uh, for those who had had themselves all cleaned up uh, and neatly, you know, in these neat and tidy packages. With just a hint of perfume or cologne to, to make them even a sweeter aroma, he died for the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. And that's so very important for us to understand at just the right time again. The details uh, in the mind of God for the good of his people, Christ died for the ungodly. At just the right time, when we were powerless. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, uh, some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? While we were yet sinners, so the Father demonstrated his love in Christ's death for us in the midst of our slop. Now, listen, uh, sometime later today, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And in Ephesians chapter 2, we are reminded that it's like, no, listen, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ Jesus while we were dead in our trespasses. Even when we were dead, in our transgressions, excuse me, transgressions, a stronger word, our acts of rebellion, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ Jesus. The Father demonstrates his love for us that, that in Christ's death, there was a demonstration of the love of God for you in the midst of your slop, not waiting until you cleaned yourself up. And so listen, if that's still your thing today, it's like, well, listen, so, so maybe you're watching these in the privacy of your own home uh, or, you know, sitting in your car watching this right now thinking, okay, well, one of these days I'm going to get good enough, then I'm going to be good enough, and then I'm going to come to God. Um, the enemy is dead set on making you realize um, constantly just to keep you busy with trying to clean yourself up. God didn't wait until you cleaned yourself up while we were still sinners. Christ died for us, all right? So verses 9 through 11, as we, as we wrap this up, just a few things here that we need to see. And the first thing is that since now we have been justified by his blood, okay? Fully pardoned through the blood of Christ. So it was only his death on the cross uh, that blood, our faith in Christ and his full, full work on the cross, that's how then we have been justified. So how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So being fully pardoned that we read about in chapter 5, verse 1, therefore since we have been justified through faith, fully pardoned means that we've been saved from the wrath of God. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that to know that we've been saved from God's wrath. We had a bullseye, so to speak, on our backs, but we have been saved from the wrath of God. Now, you may recall that just a couple of Sundays ago in, uh, in chapter 3, we were reminded that, that those who are still counting on their own righteousness, they are storing up against themselves the wrath of God. So like just piling it up. God's wrath just keeps piling and piling and piling and piling um, that's what's happening for people who are trying to fix their own way to God, okay? Trying to be good enough. Rejecting the, the offering of Christ on the cross, rejecting that and trying to do their own thing, those individuals are storing up God's wrath against them. But those who put their faith in Jesus Christ have been saved from God's wrath. Now, we, as we talked about a couple of Sundays ago, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it right now, but because God is a just God, that wrath had to go somewhere. So you and I, were by faith in Christ Jesus, you and I were spared from his wrath. Well, where did that wrath go? Because it had to go somewhere. God is just. And so there had to be a payment for sin. Well, of course. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Christ. 
Our sins born on, born by him. Our sin he carried to the cross where he purchased our salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, as we've talked about a lot in the last few weeks, but he became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness, okay? And so being saved from God's wrath, what an incredible picture, uh, saved from the wrath of God, uh, from which there is no escape apart from Jesus. According to the text, if we have been, we have been justified through his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him, through Jesus Christ, only way we're saved from God's wrath, verse 10, 4. If when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more than having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Uh, if, if when we were God's enemies, when were we God's enemies? I'll tell you when we were God's enemies. We were God's enemies right up to the point of being declared righteous by faith in Christ Jesus. And so, so if you this day are still living an unsurrendered life to Jesus Christ, then you need to know that you are still an enemy of God. And as I mentioned just moments ago, and you are still storing up God's wrath against you. That you shouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing that you're storing up the wrath of God against you. You simply shouldn't. But if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his own son, how much more shall we be saved from uh, saved through his life. I want to go back to you. It just appears that I got this one slide out of order, um, but it's really good. It's actually just a quote from John MacArthur speaking about the wrath, uh, the, the wrath of God from which we have been saved. MacArthur said it this way, and I just found it helpful. He says, Christ bore the full, f Christ bore the full fury of God's wrath. In the believing sinner's place, and there is none left for him. Christ bore the full fury of God's wrath. In the believing sinner's place, and there is none left for him. There is none left for the believing sinner. There is none, no wrath of God left for the believing sinner. Romans chapter 8, which we'll get to in a few weeks, but Romans chapter 8 says, listen, there is no condemnation than to those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and again in chapter 5, we, we see about uh, the work of Jesus Christ saving us from the wrath of God. Absolutely, incredibly beautiful. And so that's the one thing that we see. That's the one thing that we see in verses 9 through 11 so we have been saved from God's wrath. And he finishes up then in saying that, listen, but you've also been reconciled to him. Reconciled to him. And so, so reconciled to, to your enemy. You ever, you ever made up with, with a, a, an enemy? Maybe something had got between you and a dear friend. There was once a really beautiful relationship and, and then it turned really, really ugly. And do you remember how good it felt to be able to reconcile? It's like, ah. Well, listen, we were enemies of God. We have been reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. Paul wrote about it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that if anyone, is in, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself. Now, hold on. Imagine the love of God. You don't have to imagine it. Many of you have experienced it. But, but the love of God who reconciled us to himself. We were the offender. We were the offender. He reconciled us to him. This isn't so, you know, we just thought we would kind of buddy up to God. No, the one that we offended reconciled us to himself. That all this is from God who reconciled us to himself, how through Jesus Christ, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's 
sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. I mean, who have you told lately? Who have you told lately? Because that's it. If we then, according to the text, goes on, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You still wondering why we call Good Friday good? Right? I mean, this is indeed something to rejoice in. We've been reconciled to God. While enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through Christ's death. Having been reconciled to God. The past, the, the power, excuse me, that raised Christ to life is certainly sufficient to keep us. What an incredible, what an incredible offering that God has made us in Christ Jesus. We have been justified through faith. We have peace with him. We have, as a result, been reconciled to him. And we have at work within us the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Friends, he is sufficient. I guess the question that I would ask as we close, simply this. Are you, are you holding on to him? Or are you just enjoying the fact that he is holding on to you? I mean, is it all about your work or is it resting in his work? Something to think about. Pray with me. Father, God, we do thank you for this great day and the opportunity that we have to come before you. God, I do pray that, that as we've spent this time in your word, Lord, bring our hearts to life in its hearing. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, we pray. And, and, and indeed, may the joy, uh, uh, the truths that we've uncovered here, may that joy, Lord, just be filled to overflowing within us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, listen, friends, love you like crazy. Have a blessed, blessed day. And go tell somebody what Christ has done in you, what he is doing in you, what he has done for you. And, um, well, indeed, show and tell, all right? Uh, love you.